Welcome to this segment of The Black Madonna Speaks with me, your host and author of the book, The Black Madonna, Mysterious Soul Companion, Stephanie Georgiev. In this segment, we will be exploring an interesting concept that is not specific to the Black Madonna, but we see this motif in numerous Madonnas throughout the ages. The material I will be presenting is part of my upcoming book on the Virgin of Guadalupe, which is set to be released on Pentecost of 2018. Make sure to subscribe to this channel, follow me on Facebook and Twitter for updates on the specifics of the new release. Every Christmas, I enjoy the Festival of Carols broadcast from the BBC on my local classical station, which is KUSC. This production, the Festival of Carols, started in 1918, which is so interesting because that was a hundred years ago from this recording, and also at the conclusion of World War I. The Festival of Carols is a mix of traditional and modern Christmas carols, mixed in with Bible verses relevant to Advent and Christmas. The service begins with Genesis, with the story of Adam and Eve, and concludes with the birth of Christ. In the church lectionary for Christmas Eve, as well as verses read in the liturgy of the Christian community, we also visit the Genesis narrative. Then we visit the prophecies of Isaiah regarding the incarnation of Christ. Throughout the season before Advent, biblical readings focus on the apocalypse of St. John. So the biblical readings that we visit during that time of year, as well as uh, throughout Advent and Christmas, we have this interesting story from the beginning of time in Genesis through the incarnation and passion of Christ to, to the apocalypse, which is basically the so-called end of time. In anthroposophy, we read we view the incarnation of Christ as the turning point of time. And for those of you who are interested, there are two Steiner lecture cycles which approach the book of Revelation or the Apocalypse of John, which delve into this approach on the incarnation and resurrection of Christ as basically being smack dab in the middle of cosmic evolution. As I have been studying anthroposophy and the Christology of Rudolf Steiner for my writings and talks regarding the Black Madonna and the Virgin of Guadalupe, something very interesting has come apparent to me. For me, and please remember, as I have said before, these are my insights based on my research. I respect everyone's right to view things and have beliefs in which they feel comfortable. But for me, the narratives I have been reading and listening to my whole life in the Bible have come to have new meaning through this perspective of anthroposophy. For me, the Bible is metaphysically literal. I know these words do not always go together, but I approach the Judeo-Christian Bible as both a narrative of cosmic history and also as an initiation document. So what do I mean by initiation? Initiation, from my perspective, is a process where wisdom and enlightenment are opened to individuals through a series of ordeals and lessons, resulting in a transformation of the initiate in some form. For those of us who have had the pleasure of being in a sorority or fraternity, we had initiation ceremonies where we were given certain secrets of the organization after going through a pledge period. In this pledge period, we had to do certain things and pass tests in order to be a member of the organization. We see in indigenous cultures such as Aborigines of Australia and various tribes of North and South America, tribal cultures in Africa, where the initiate has to undergo both trials as well as ceremonies in order to achieve a certain status in the culture. In Native American traditions, the vision quest comes to mind, where the individual goes out into the wild without food or water, survives, and then comes back with a new perspective on their lives and purpose. 
Some of our modern initiation ceremonies can be viewed as events such as bar or bat mitzvahs, confirmation, and I would also argue school and graduation. Any person who's gone through a bachelor's, master's, or doctoral program, I'm sure, would agree that the ordeal of getting that piece of paper, the wisdom and knowledge attained, and the ceremony that follows would rival any sort of ancient initiation cult in terms of difficulty and transformation. So the Bible, in my perspective, is a document that not only gives perspective on history and the future, but also gives insights into what I would call the initiation of humanity. We observe in the Genesis narrative the creation of humanity and how humanity took a path away from divinity. We call this event the fall or the fall from the Garden of Eden. We read and learn from that moment forward about all the characters and dramas in the Old Testament. And we as Christians learn about the Christ event in the Gospels, how to form a new community within the new covenant of Christ through the book of Acts and the epistles. <clears throat> and then ultimately what is to happen in the future through the book of Revelation. In essence, how I view scripture the Bible for me is the grand plan B as a guidebook back to divinity. So how are we to view the Bible as a book of initiation? When I comprehend the Genesis narrative, what I understand is there is an amazing creative act, an act I think had quite a bit of forethought involved in terms of creating both the cosmos and humanity. Humans, we read in the Genesis narrative, were basically created as a pinnacle of the creation event. We come to understand that we were created in the likeness and, individ and, likeness and image of divinity, meaning we have freedom. The plan for humanity, in my estimation, was well thought out. But due to freedom, humanity chose to divert from the ultimate template. Father Thomas Berry, a famous passionist priest and theologian said it best. He said that divinity created humanity in order to have a reflection. Other theologians often comment that divinity created humanity because divinity wanted company. In any case, humanity took full advantage of our freedom and in the context of anthroposophical Christology, chose to enter into material reality too quickly. My resident Los Angeles Christian community priest put the response to me to this fall of man into a simple terms. She said that after the fall of man, the spiritual world realized bestowing complete freedom on cosmic neophytes, such as humans, was in essence a bit unfair. Humanity lacked the wisdom and experience to handle such a responsibility. Through numerous lectures, we learn from Rudolf Steiner that the spiritual world and divinity's response to the fall was to basically go back to the conference room drawing board, so to speak, and design a new plan to allow humanity, in essence, to come back to the original plan. We hear glimpses of this in the Genesis verses where God was telling the snake that the son of the woman would bruise his head. The challenge to this design for humanity to go back to the original plan of conscious unity with divinity was to fully honor human freedom in the process. My understanding of this process was for the spiritual world to in essence devise what we would call an initiation process or an educational program that would give humanity the tools and skills it needed in order to get back with the program or the original intent of the creator. In simpler terms, a plan B was devised for humanity.
The ultimate goal of this process of this plan B was to help guide humanity to choose in full freedom and full consciousness to unify with divinity as a member of the cosmic community. In my opinion, this is basically the narrative of the Bible from the fall that we read about in Genesis to the apocalypse of John. To understand this plan through the lens of anthroposophical Christology and some esoteric Christian sects, the process by which we are educated in order to transform and choose in full freedom and consciousness to unify with divinity is outlined in the Bible. The narrative of the Bible tells us about our origins, our missteps, guidelines for progress, and offers, offers us the ultimate model through the life, passion, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. How our ordeal, our initiation, will unfold. And then the Bible ultimately tells us what is next in cosmic evolution through the apocalypse of John. The key for me to comprehend all of this also lies in anthroposophical Christology. The basis for understanding this initiation process we must go through lies within the context of what Steiner calls the fourfold human being. This fourfold human being is what us humans, both individually and collectively, and means that we are made up of four bodies. Again, both individually and collectively. We are made up of the following. We are made of a physical body, an etheric body, an astral body, and an I or ego. The physical body is self-explanatory. We have flesh and bones made up of atoms and chemical compounds. The etheric body is considered the life body, which animates our flesh and bones, and in essence is the body whose presence determines whether or not one is alive or dead. The astral body is that body that connects our senses and perceptions with our consciousness. It also travels in and out of our physical body during sleep and connects with the spiritual realm. The I, or ego, is in essence who we are. It is also our connection with divinity. Our I and ego is the spark of the divine that each one of us has. <clears throat> when we say I, we are recognizing the Christ within. Within our I is the eternal that is not limited to our physical existence. This I that we talk about, this I or ego, was first articulated to Moses through the burning bush. And, and we know from this story when he says, be still, I am the I am. And this ancient story at the very beginnings of the Bible showed us a new way to Christ, the ultimate I am. It is actually Christ through his incarnation, passion, and resurrection that allowed humanity to recognize their individual eyes or egos and develop them accordingly. The original plan for humanity, the one that was available before the fall, was for humans to slowly develop different aspects of themselves individually and collectively in order to companion divinity. After the fall, what I am calling the school of life was set up in order for humans to develop accordingly, was the grand initiation, in other words. We read in Genesis, though, that this time the path to union with divinity would not be quite as pleasurable. We were told we would have to work by the sweat of our brow. The key to comprehending this cosmology, that of humans evolving in order to meet divinity in full freedom and consciousness, is the subject of reincarnation. 
we can consider reincarnation as how we, the individual human eye, incarnates on Earth through subsequent lives in various points of history. Something modern theologians and Bible scholars in the West have not factored into comprehending the consequence and remedy of the fall of man is the concept of reincarnation. Reincarnation is a topic way beyond our scope in this segment, but suffice to say that it is not exactly absent from the Bible and was not absent in early Christian traditions. In fact, we in the modern West are really the only cultures that reject reincarnation. It is embraced in many traditions throughout the world. I reject the notion that all verses on reincarnation were removed from the Bible at the Fifth Ecumenical Council. Reincarnation was not even on the agenda for anybody that bothers to look at the uh, notes of the meeting. Some argue that the Bible is actually rich in narrative regarding reincarnation. There's an excellent discussion of reincarnation in the Bible in the book, The Soul's Long Journey by Edward Riau Smith, whose scholarship in this area is quite exhaustive. In fact, his footnotes get a bit tedious at times, but he is a lawyer by trade and quite dedicated to the concepts of proof and evidence. His writings, reflect this orientation, and for scientists like me, I deeply appreciate this approach. I invite those of you who are curious to give him a look, and his website, The Bible and Anthroposophy, is worth exploring if you get the chance. What I have gleaned from this orientation towards scripture and the lectures of Rudolf Steiner on the subject gives me insight into a motif we see in, through many of the Madonnas, throughout the history of Christianity and Christian art. <clears throat> in many Madonnas, we see the presentation that was first articulated in Revelations 12, verse 1. A woman appeared who was clothed in the sun with the moon at her feet and a crown of stars, of 12 stars on her head. We see these 12 stars in many icons of the Madonna be they black, white, or mestizo. And we also see these motifs of rays of a sun, a crescent moon, and if there are not stars in the crown around the Madonna's head, then we see the stars in her mantle and veil. We see stars in Guadalupe's mantle. And we also see on Shestahova's mantle, images of stars. And you see a star right above her forehead there. So let's go back to the topic of our segment, the Virgin Sophia and the Black Madonna. What is Sophia? We see images of Sophia more in ancient Christian iconography and more frequently in Eastern Orthodox traditions. Sophia, the feminine wisdom of God, or holy wisdom, is articulated through what are called the wisdom scriptures, which include books in the Old Testament as well as the Apocrypha, the book of Proverbs, Job, Ecclesiastes, Psalm, Song of Solomon's, Book of Wisdoms, Book of Sirach, are the most commonly recognized book of wisdom. Some traditions include the book of Baruch in the myth. We hear most significantly about the creation of Sophia in Proverbs 8, verse 22 through 31. And I will be reading those verses from the New International Version. The Lord brought me forth as the first of his works, before his deeds of old. I was formed long ages ago, at the very beginning, when the world came to be. When there were no watery depths, I was given birth. When there were no springs overflowing with water. Before the mountains were settled in place, before the hills, I was given birth. Before he made the world or its field or any dust upon the earth, I was there when he set the heavens in place. When he marked the horizon on the face of the deep, when he established the clouds above and fixed securely the fountains of the deep. 
when he gave the sea its boundary so the waters would not overstep his command, and when he marked the foundations of the earth, when I was constantly at his side, I was filled with delight day after day, rejoicing always in his presence, rejoicing in the whole world and delighting in mankind. One of the ways <clears throat> of comprehending this birth of Sophia verse is to understand that it says Sophia or wisdom was the first of all creations. We read in the beginning of John's gospel that, quote, in the beginning was the word and not one thing in all creation was made without him. The word was the source of life, unquote. We also understand that the word the evangelist uses in this gospel for the word of God is the word logos. In Sophianic Christian traditions, there is a great interplay between the Sophia and the logos. The way I comprehend this is that in order for the logos to manifest creation, there had to be a matrix, a container for this logos to have form. Cosmologists tell us that in the formation of our Earth, in the extremely early days, there was no atmosphere. We get a bit of this inkling when we view astronauts on the moon. The light of the sun basically whizzes by, and the light of the stars is seen as pinpoints within a vast velvety darkness. This is because there is no atmosphere. After many events, the Earth obtained an atmosphere of oxygen, hydrogen, and other substances. The creation of the atmosphere allowed Earth to capture sunlight and utilize it through things like photosynthesis, climate, and temperature. On Earth, we have an atmosphere which lights up during the day and shows itself as our blue sky. The atmosphere of Earth is, in essence, a capturing of light. This is how I see Sophia as the atmosphere or structure that allows the form of light and creation to manifest. Sophia is the container, if you will, for the Logos. The Logos created her as the first of all creations, and she allows creation to fill the spaces, so to speak. The Sophia and Logos are interdependent and each has a unique gesture and impulse, and together they weave the substance of the cosmos. The Sophia is the representative of the divine feminine, and the Logos is the representative of the divine masculine. The Virgin Mary is seen as the human embodiment of the divine Sophia. Christ Jesus is seen as the human embodiment of the divine Logos, as we learn in the epilogue of John's gospel, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. But I would like to add, he needed a woman, his mother Mary, in order to make that happen. As we have learned in various segments, as well as in my book, The Black Madonna Mysterious Soul Companion, the Madonna in art is the image and symbol for the human soul and for humanity. The Virgin Mary has many names, but one of the most significant is how she is referred to as the mother of humanity. We might be tempted to think that actually it was Eve from Genesis as the mother of humanity, but Mary, as her task and example set before us, is considered the new Eve, the transform Eve, helping to set us back on the track that we were supposed to have taken so long ago. Mary is also seen as the grail or the container of Christ. The Madonna's with stars on her head is a metaphor and symbol for what we are to accomplish in this segment of evolution. Steiner tells us that each subsequent historical period is an opportunity to develop individually and collectively. Through his cycles on the pictures of the apocalypse, he shows us that each one of the letters to the seven churches symbolizes a historical epoch and a task that each epoch has to attain. 
At the end of the letters, we read in Revelations chapter 3, verse 20, that after these challenges or what I would call stages of initiation, the mystic lamb says, quote, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any hear my voice, the word, and opens the door, I will come into their house and eat with them, and they will eat with me. Hearing the knock, the opening and opening the door to the mystic lamb is the deeply metaphorical future event whereby humanity, after lengthy preparation, will be able to open their prepared bodies, minds, hearts, and souls to Christ in full freedom and consciousness. This could not be done in ages past, mainly because humans did not really have the capacity to meet such a being. And we chose to veer off this path, so to speak, during the fall. But we are, as the book of Revelation tells us, preparing for that event through great trial, ordeal, and initiation throughout the ages. We are, in essence, to work towards becoming Virgin Sophias. The word virgin has many connotations. In materialistic terms, we often limit our understanding of virgin to mean without sexual intercourse. But the, virgin also, the word virgin also means pure. It is within this context, I feel, that the scriptures and images of the Madonna, be they black, white, or mestizo, as they are in the Virgin of Guadalupe, appears to be speaking to us. We fell through our choices so long ago in Eden. We have sullied our purity, but we can, through our efforts and grace of God, purify ourselves. As the 12 stars we see on the virgin head symbolize the wisdom of the cosmos. The number 12 represents the educational process on all levels and the submission of the will required and sacrifice necessary to achieve knowledge and wisdom on both spiritual and intellectual levels. The mind will be illuminated with the answers it seeks. This is what the number 12 signifies. The number 12 also signifies completeness. The number 12 represents cycles of experience and regeneration towards a higher consciousness, knowledge, and higher wisdom, sensitivity, education, and the intellect. And it's very interesting that we see this version of the apocalypse where they say specifically that she has 12 stars on her head. We see the number 12 throughout the Bible, 12 tribes of Israel, 12 disciples, and the number 12 is actually mentioned 187 times in the Bible. In nature, we have 12 months in the solar calendar, 12 constellations in the zodiac. Interestingly, there are also 12 cranial nerves, meaning 12 major nerves in the brain which animate the body, as well as 12 thoracic vertebrae, ber I'm sorry, 12 thoracic vertebrae and 12 nerves associated with those vertebrae. It is in this set of vertebrae uh, that surrounds the heart. The number 12 has profound mystical meaning. Notice the 12 stars are not on her belly or her feet, but on her head, symbolizing that such cosmic wisdom can stream into our thoughts and perceptions. Steiner tells us that our current task during this era is to prepare our astral bodies to meet with the mystical lamb, the cosmic Christ. In the previous epoch, through the Christ event, we were able to purify our I or our egos. Our current epoch, we are striving to purify our astral bodies. The next epoch, we will purify our etheric bodies. And finally, in the following epoch, we will purify our physical bodies so that we can answer that profound knock on the door to our fully prepared beings and our fully prepared astral, etheric, physical, and I to have the Christ enter 
us and be one with us. The Madonnas of our era are inviting us to purify our astral bodies, our sensing bodies that connect with spirit. As symbols and metaphors for the human soul, they show this to us through the 12 stars on their heads, the cosmic wisdom streaming from the heavens, penetrating our beings, our thinking, so that we can be fully conscious to meet our next stage of in initiation. So how do we purify our astral bodies? By surrounding ourselves with beauty, by thinking positively, by exposing our senses to natural things, and nourishing our souls with scriptures and the arts. The purifying of our astral bodies will enable us in the next age to purify our etheric bodies and live heart-filled, loving, and caring lives for our fellow human beings. Through this purification, we are taking one more step towards being able to be containers for the Christ. We will be the containers of the Logos. As we see in this first inkling, where the burning bush said to Moses, I am that I am. Now, we see the completion of this through the virgin as the new burning bush, as well as the symbol of humanity saying, I am that I am. We will arrive at this through what I call the ultimate great course of humanity, the cosmic initiation of humanity. This is our destiny. The artistic images show us what we are capable of and invite us to continue and support us along the way. So in spite of all the distractions, fill your senses with true deep beauty. Immerse yourself in wisdom scriptures. Gaze at the stars. Greet the sun. Indulge in nourishing conversation. Dance with abandon. Smell those flowers and love with all your might. Work for justice. Transform suffering into wisdom. This is how we can achieve our cosmic destiny. I, for one, want to be ready for that knock on the door. So I may greet the mystic lamb in full preparation. I pray for the strength to be ready to do that. And I pray that we can greet the mystic lamb together and ask for your prayers for me in order to do that as well. Blessings on your journey. For those of you who would like to read more about this subject, in addition to anticipating the book on the Virgin of Guadalupe, which will be released uh, Pentecost of 2018, the Black Madonna Mysterious Soul Companion is a prelude to that. And it is available at Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Kindle, Audible, and print on demand through the Expresso Book Machine. Thank you so much for your time, and I wish you a blessed day. <laughs>